Dylan and Thomas, thank you for joining me so that we could talk about Stranger Love. And before we get into the specifics of the work itself, I want to ask you about something that Octavio Paz said in um, in Alternating Current in 1967. And I know you reference Octavio Paz in Scene 12C, Lullaby. Um, and Paz wrote, art is an invention of aesthetics, which is which in turn is an invention of philosophers. What we call art is a game. Do you agree with him? And what is your view of art as evidenced by the work each of you do in general and have done specifically with Stranger Love? Uh, I'll, I'll let Thomas start as the uh, as the word the word person of the, of the duo. Uh, I, but I, 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 promise, to, I promise to answer as well. <laughs> I was going to let Dylan start. Um, hey, could you read the quote one, one more time and then I'll respond? Yes, art is an invention of aesthetics, which in turn is an invention of philosophers. What we call art is a game. Essentially, without the context, it's difficult to uh, jump in immediately. But uh, I'll say what first comes to mind, which is that there there is something um, something really interesting about thinking about games generally, which is that there are uh, there are two kinds of games you could say. There are games that actually Dylan and I were talking about this recently. There are games that are uh, solved games like tic tac toe where once the first move is made, if you know the game, you know what the, all the alternatives are. And then there are unsolved games like um, chess, which you don't know, uh, at least I certainly don't know. I know how to play the game, but I don't know what all the uh, options are. And I do like to think that uh, work like this is an open and unsolved game. There's something uh, that's necessarily undetermined at the beginning. So uh, it, both in terms of uh, the making of it and the experiencing of it. So it does feel, that in, in that sense, it does feel consistent. I guess what Paz, I don't, I don't know that quote, but what Paz might be getting at there is something like if you have a certain conception of art that emerges from a philosophical or a theoretical perspective, it might be more like a closed game. Whereas for him, if I'm reading that correctly, for him, it's... Uh, it doesn't have that closed nature. It isn't a theoretical construct, but is rather a, a, an opening or a way of being open to possibilities. And it certainly felt in creating the work, in creating this work, that there was a, an openness to what would come. Um, and part of the invitation to the audience is, I, I think, and I, we say this somewhere in one of the texts we wrote about the piece, that we invite the audience to complete the piece with us and there's no telling what how that will be done. So it has if if we're doing what we should be doing um, or what we want to be doing, I would say it has that feeling of an open game in that uh, in that regard. Dylan, <laughs> yeah, that's that's really nice. I mean, I'll tell you, I have no idea what art is. Um, it's a total mystery to me. And uh, there are a lot of things that I feel like I have some handle on of <laughs> what they are and what they do in the world. And I, I cannot tell you uh, with any certainty what I think that art is or does. Um, and in some way, that's probably why I'm so drawn to it. I, but I think that um, the, the impossibility of it, the indescribable nature of, of art, or at least of my favorite art, is the thing that like, that pulls me. And I think that Part of my part of my response to to that quote is that it's it's hard for me to imagine uh, uh, like uh, thinking about pause thinking about art as a as a philosophical creation in some way it's hard for me to imagine art as the object as the thing that gets created or gets described whereas it really feels like uh and, and, and you know e even in a broader way it's hard for me to imagine when thinking about like oh what's you know what's the purpose of art in the world uh, like even that feels like the wrong container uh, in that it feels to me kind of like uh, the world is a place where among other things we get to experience art and finding ways to uh, to be able to have that joy which is sometimes a game uh, is kind of the greatest thing that exists on this planet um, so I always find it hard to talk about art uh, because it feels like art is the art is the thing that's talking about us and we're just trying to find it. Well, that's what the best art is. The best art, I think, is the art that tells us that reflects a mirror back on us. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
in your in the first sentence of your artist statement on the Stranger Love website, Dylan, you say Stranger Love is not practical. It strikes me as as if art isn't in and of itself isn't practical and really shouldn't be practical. But is there a practicality that is required to create art? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, in, in some sense, certainly, like it, you know, if, if it exists in the world, then it, it requires the uh, <laughs> the tools of our world in order to bring it into life. But I, I think that um, kind of what you just said about best art, it's it's like the the pursuit of art is not a practical pursuit. Uh, there uh, there are so many other things that that uh, you know, as an artist, I've chosen to spend my life doing this this one very impractical thing and if i was trying to do something practical i would choose to do just about anything else in the world uh and so so going into it with that mindset it does feel like it doesn't feel right to me to be thinking about the practicality of the thing i'm creating at the beginning um because the whole point is that i'm doing something that that's after beauty, joy, the experience of the world in ways that live outside of the, that day-to-day -day experience, the things that are practical, the things that are, are uh, that are often necessities of, of the world, but uh, devoting a life to trying to create something that's outside of that, uh, it felt, I mean, guess I'm someone who imagines things in their extremes, and it always felt like it didn't make sense to think about the practicality of something that is fundamentally kind of anti-practical. And so Stranger Love coming out of that is is about as far, maybe not as far as I could imagine, but very far uh, in one, uh, uh, towards one end of that spectrum of something that is an absolute, total, amazing dream that uh, was conceived completely without practicality. And I would assume this is the kind of project for both of you that almost everybody would say, you've got to be out of your minds. Why would you do something like this? It's never going to get performed. How do you how do you buttress yourselves and move forward with your vision with something that, you know, is commonly defined as, you know, a a wild concept? Phil, you um, take that first. All right, so say it one more time. <laughs> well, you know, this, I, I'm thinking of, of Stephen Sondheim's musical uh, Sunday in the Park with George, where he talks about art isn't easy, mm -hmm. you know, and how everybody, you know, like you get constantly get told that what you want to do is not practical, it can't and shouldn't be done. Yeah. How do you move forward when a lot of the world is telling you what not to do when this is what you want to do? And for people who are watching this, Stranger Love is a six hour opera. Um, it's really, 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 really hard is the answer to that question. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, it's, I, I feel like this life that I've chosen is the, the best thing that I could possibly do, but I'm not sure that I would recommend it to anybody else. It's extremely difficult to, um, to, yeah, to want something to exist in the world that doesn't, um, uh, or to want the world to exist in a way that it doesn't quite, uh, and to try and to try and change everything into, um, uh, into the the uh, the shape that would make that happen. It's so difficult, and it really, um, for me, kind of like shows me how small I am as a human being against the, the forces of the world and the universe. Uh, in a way that uh, I, I've felt that in an ecstatic way when I look at the stars, I feel gloriously happy to be so tiny in the universe. But it's also something that's very terrifying in another way to see like how uh how strong the rest of the world is if you want it to be different at all i would say a couple of things i think to a large extent at least in my experience it's beyond um my decision or control uh in certain ways one way <laughs> the 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 beauty and the goodness of the thing you're making draws you on and inspires you and that the uh, the joy and the, the thrill of seeing it come into being is so sustaining that even with the uh the onslaught of doubt or um criticism or feeling of it uh, be, being told as you're saying being told that's impossible yes but <laughs> 
it's so beautiful it has to be and that you know where that comes from is a mystery to me but i think that's part of it and another is um the good fortune of having extraordinary collaborators i mean dylan it, you know if i if i fi feel myself flagging he's lifting it up and we've worked now with uh, other people too uh, the people who are working on the show it's just extraordinary to see them dedicating themselves to it and revealing this piece to us in ways that we hadn't seen before uh, so that I, I think that's also you know to a certain degree that's chosen but to a certain degree that's given and you just get lucky sometimes what was the original impetus for this project and 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 was it was it always something you both envisioned as having you know a serious length as it does so this is a great question tom thomas do you want to start we can probably sure yeah i'll i'll start this one um i mean in, you know craig in a way I, it, i've been thinking about this a lot lately and in a way it's a sort of thing you're this is the sort of thing one has been preparing for all one's life i mean it's true of course everything that you do in a way, you've been preparing for it all your life. But with this, really, I, I felt that so much of things that I'd been thinking about for a very long time and Dylan had been thinking about for a very long time really came together in this. Uh, so that's, in a way, the the deeper answer. Uh, there, there was also there was a time when we first started talking about it was in um, 2012, if you can believe it, in April of 2012. And I remember uh, coming out of a, com a, a concert that Dylan had uh, performed in. He, he found, Dylan co-founded a group called Contemporaneous, which is the band that's performing at uh, Disney Hall on Saturday, co-founded it with David Bloom. And I was an early fan of Contemporaneous and went to one of their concerts. And I remember coming out of it with an idea that felt it had a certain structure to it and it had various parts. There were voices and I could go into more detail. But um, it felt to me like a musical idea that might make sense with some voices. It had a specific structure. And I uh, shared that idea with Dylan at the time. And Dylan said, hey, that's great. I've been thinking I want to be writing vocal music. Why don't you write words? I write music. We'll see where it goes. And from that initial structure, which um, is present in the piece as it is now to a certain extent, um, we started a conversation very slowly adding ideas back and forth but uh and then there are a lot of steps but dylan was also preparing all his life for this so dylan why don't you pick up the story yeah it's it's true um yeah it's a good it's a i i feel like um thomas has heard this but i feel like going back further for me makes sense where i was six years old when i knew that i wanted to be a composer um and I like very quickly was introduced to the magic of creating something out of nothing uh, in that way. And it was the most wonderful thing in the world. And uh, I'd spent most of my life with that kind of certainty of knowing like, okay, this is what I, this is what I do. Uh, and this is uh, the life that I want. And it was around that time in 2012 when I realized and I, I had, I had spent my whole life on that path and I had done all the things that it seemed to make sense to do uh, to become a composer. Um, and I realized around then that the, the things I really, really wanted to create were not really accessible on that path. Um, that like it, it, the kind of like standard, um, composer path sees people, you know, find, finding commissions, you get a, you know, a, a piano trio commission for 15 minute piece as part of a concert, like, and you know, there's incredible music that's been created that way. But I, I realized that what I wanted to create were kind of like worlds that people could live in for as long as possible uh and 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 it wasn't necessarily a realization that I wanted to write long music but it was a realization that I wanted to write things that would like totally change uh your life um from the moment when you stepped into it to the moment you left and uh I, because those were my favorite things and I, it was at that moment I also realized that like the that path just wouldn't ever get me there no matter how successful I was and that it really required uh, kind of taking a huge leap into the unknown in order to carve out a different life for myself. And so when Thomas had this idea, it was right around this, the same point in my life where I was realizing that like, I, I, I felt like I had the capacity to do it, um, that I could do, I could make the things that I felt like were my favorite things in the world, but it would necessitate me giving everything to doing it. Um, and 
it took a couple of years from that moment when Thomas sent that idea to to really kind of making that decision uh, and saying like, okay, this is this is what I'm gonna do. Uh, and I I I I had gone to Point Reyes uh, on Christmas or the day before Christmas in 2014, I think. Um, and had sat on the beach thinking about this piece and had imagined the second and third acts uh, as part of it and and seen the way that this this piece that was a love story about the seasons could could be a thing that was about everything uh, and that and that allowed us to experience the like impossible things that I wanted so badly to experience and to share with other people. Uh, and so that was when I wrote to Thomas and said, like, I'm going to do this uh, and it's going to be, I, I didn't say this in, in those specific words, but the uh, the point of what I was saying was like, this is going to be my life um, and uh, I'd love for you to join me. <laughs> and so that was really, um, that was where it took off and then really spent the next three years doing pretty much nothing but writing this music. Now, it's my understanding that at the 2018 performance that was part of Prototype, um, that it was just the first act that that was ready at that point. Was there anything each of you learned out of those two performances on the 16th and 17th? I think it was January of that year um, that informed changes or alterations you would make in what you had already done and also inform what was left to be written. So I, I see Thomas smiling because I, 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 and I know exactly what he's thinking, um, which is a big part of our collaboration. But the, so what I would say, I actually, I think the music was all finished at that point, um, but it, it was only the first act that was performed. Uh, the first act is the first four hours. So it was still a lot of, a lot of music that was performed. Um, and it, it was, it was not staged. It was a concert performance, but the thing that, uh, the thing that I learned, um, and I have a feeling this is in Thomas' head as well, is that the piece actually did the totally wild things that we were imagining it would do. And that was an extraordinary thing to find out because, it, you know, we uh, we were confident. I went in with some sort of like totally strange uh, certainty knowing that this, this was going to be the greatest thing that I could ever do, but there was no proof. Um, and... Uh, certainly there was no reason anybody should believe me at, at that time. And when we heard the music in January of 2018 for the first time in a, in a full way, it was just this mind blowing experience to, to know like, oh, like this, this works. <laughs> this is actually that thing that we've been talking about. And, and other people came up to us, like people, people I didn't know come up to me who didn't know any of these like years of conversations about what we hoped would happen uh, in experiencing this piece and say to me like exactly those lines of what I hoped would happen with with no context. And I'm like, yeah, this is <laughs> this is really good. Uh, so th that was my feeling uh, coming out of that. Th Thomas, I'm curious your answer here. Yeah, no, I'm gonna say exactly what you thought I was gonna say, which is basically the same thing. I mean, I'll, I'll add something else, but the main point is, yeah, this was the moment at which I realized this is an extraordinary thing. And the, the story for me is that um, the intermission of the uh, first performance, actually the intermission of the second performance, um, I is the first performance I was so sort of, there were two performances. The first performance I was so overwhelmed and didn't really hear it fully. And the second performance, I sat further back. And finally, I heard the piece. And at intermission, I was so ecstatic that I ran out of the theater and ran 10 blocks straight through uh, through Brooklyn Heights, just as fast as I could down Atlantic Avenue, because I just had to get this energy. I, I, it was unlike anything I'd ever experienced. And it was in that moment that I knew that, that we had achieved this thing, we'd made this thing. And then it was, what do we do to make it actually bring it to the rest of the world? But it was an affirmation, proof of concept, persuasive um, celebration, I think. I mean, that's the main thing. And then in terms of uh, things that we would change, interestingly, as we were making the piece, the, oh, the whole image, all of it was in a way already in place in our minds by the time 2018, uh, by the time of that performance. So that was just a, a concert performance of act one, as you said, but we had always all along been talking about 
how it would look and how it would be, how the acts would relate to one another, how it'd be staged, how, what the timing would be like. And that was all confirmed um, in uh, 2018, but it didn't, it did it felt more like, uh, more like someone tapped us on the back and like God tapped us on the back and said, yes, boys, keep going, uh, rather than realizing that there was something we needed to change. The, the other thing I would add to that also, which Thomas kind of alluded to, is that I think that was the moment when the experience of the whole journey really shifted for, for me, at least, of the first, so it was 2018, so the first six years really were just like absolute joy, because it feels really great to be doing the thing that you know is the best thing that you can do on the planet. That's an incredible feeling. It can't really be beat. And it was that moment in 2018 when I realized it's not enough to just do that it really, really has to be shared. Um, and so then the well, the path from there to right now has been extremely difficult um, in so many ways, but, uh, but from a mental health standpoint, just really, really hard to know that there's this thing that's my favorite thing in the universe that all I want is to be able to share it with other people and that it's impossible. Um, so that, that, that moment, it, it affirmed and it also made it all so terrifying. <laughs> Did the work tell you that it needed to be six hours? Yes. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. It, it was not, um, it, we did not go into this saying, let's write a six hour piece. Um, we we went into it. Uh, I mean, I think the, the initial vision that Thomas had had, um, he was thinking, oh, it's maybe an hour. Um, and at the time we were like, oh, wow, that's big, you know, big, big piece. Uh, and it was, it, it was really like, it was the process of finding the piece that we experienced over this whole journey, uh, where it would be like, you know, it's start writing and I'd be like, wow, this, like for this section to work, it really has to be 25 minutes or whatever. And it's like, yeah, well, this section's 25 minutes. Like <laughs> how long is this piece going to be? And we, we kept kind of coming back and asking ourselves like, uh, like, should we, you know, uh, it's, it's getting over. It's like, it's going to be over three hours now. Like, is that a problem? And we just kept coming back to kind of your first question of being like, you know, this is the thing that we're doing in our lives. Like, I don't think it makes sense to write this totally wild thing that can never exist and be like, yeah, but it had to be under three hours. Uh, and so we just kept following it, following it wherever it seemed like it was supposed to go and it and ended up at the length that it is, which is like five hours and 48 minutes of music or something. Oh, well, then there, I, I've been overstating it at six hours. My apologies. I think that's fine. It also includes, a, you know, a 15 minute intermission and an hour dinner break. So it, it, it the whole experience is well over six hours. <laughs> there are these great uh, messages between us, emails or texts where one of us says, wait a sec, you know, this is getting very long. And the, and the other one says, yeah, that's OK. Let's just do what we need to do and, you know, worry about it later. One of the things I'm grateful for about the Stranger Love website is that it gave me an opportunity to listen to, to four different excerpts from the work. And I found myself getting into a very meditative state, that it was forcing me, even though I was relying on technology to hear it, it was forcing me to shut out all the other stuff. And I feel like there's a lot of work that's being done at this time in our lives that is asking us to sort of cut out the noise. Why is that important to both of you? Because I assume that is an ultimate goal for what this work accomplishes. Absolutely. I feel like, Thomas, maybe you should start with that. I'll start. Yeah. I'll start. I mean, there's a lot to say. It's really, I'm glad to hear that you had that experience. And it's my experience, too, of listening to the music. Um, part of it uh, is, and again, it wasn't, I should say, we didn't set out to write a piece that would have that effect uh, or would do that. I mean, it was really, a, don't, the words Dylan used before are the right ones in my experience too, that we, we were finding it or we were in, uncovering a piece that was there. But what we made ended up, or what came, what we uncovered uh, does have that effect. And I think that uh, one of the reasons why it's so important and so valuable is because uh, there's a, a way in which stepping out of our normal experience of temporality, our normal experience of time, which increasingly is fragmented and uh, we're mo jumping from one thing to another and every, you know, something gets in the news and it's there for a minute and the next thing is there and the next thing is there and we're talking to this person and that person, that person. Stepping outside of that 
slowing down, slowing down time, I think permits, one way to talk about it is for the imagination to dilate, to expand. And that's not just the creative or the artistic imagination, it's also the ethical imagination, the political imagination, to be able to think about things that move at a different time scale. I mean, just to choose one very prominent contemporary example, climate change. To think, to be able to think, but there are so many other examples of things that require a kind of thinking that is not instantaneous, that uh, requires that you dwell for a while, that you move slowly, that in the words of a uh, philosopher that uh, Dylan and I read a lot, Hannah Arendt, that you stop and think. And this gives an opportunity not only to experience, I'd say three things. One, simply to step out of the fragmented and hectic temporality into another one. Second, to develop the capacity to dwell in that, which also develops the, the imaginative capacities to think about different ways of being with one another, different ways about thinking of our being individually and collectively in the world. And also because uh, it, it's so beautiful, it makes you want to dwell in that space and see the value of it and experience it as something pleasurable. So that's a, an initial response to your question, your excellent question. Yeah, I I agree with. I mean, that's yeah, that's all really well said. I think the 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 one thing I might add is that um, so so much of this piece and this music is also about um, it's wanting to give us access to the things that we love so much about being alive and to like just like live in a world that's made up of those things to remind us of uh, what's beautiful about being in this world and in order to do that I, I think it's like it is necessary to to be able to um to push out the noise to some degree and to and to live in a slower time and i i, I think that one of the things that one of the things that's really useful about the piece being so long oh a couple of things one one is that because it's so long as long as you know that going in uh you're already prepared for an experience that's unlike anything else in the rest of your life which is really helpful um because uh, because what the piece wants is for you to be able to to like spend this time and kind of like refocus in some way uh your world towards the things that you love and it and knowing when you arrive that like that's what you will be doing uh, is helpful. Uh, Cause it, you know, if you go even just like a, going to a normal concert, which can be transcendent, uh, if it's like two hours, you know, that's something that you can do in a normal day. It's like, I went, got dinner, went, went to a concert. It was a great show, uh, which is great. Uh, I absolutely love concerts. I love music, uh, but to know like, yeah, on Saturday, I'm going to spend like seven hours uh, at Disney hall doing something that is completely unlike anything else I've ever done that that puts you in in a really good frame of mind for having an experience that is in fact unlike anything else and the, the other thing about it is that uh the way it's designed it, the hope is that it um with that time it has it has time to teach itself to you and to teach you the ways that uh that you might experience it uh, which is something that's really difficult with um, music that's shorter where like things things go by and to have a lot of length when you're creating something like this is really nice because you can you can you can go in with no preparation you can arrive having never heard a note of music ever before in your life and by the end of those six hours you'll be like i know that theme um, in in a very literal way uh, but it, in a more uh, figurative way it, it really like it allows you to understand it uh, by having enough time to learn what it is and that i think is really helpful for for allowing that experience if only people yeah, that, are really good at listening. I mean, I sort of feel like that's that is a hurdle because I find that the art of listening is a dying art. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think you're right. I, and I think that the piece is, is very helpful. Um, so I think that it, it, there's a way in which it teaches you to listen. Uh, so maybe it can indeed be like helpful for that pursuit for people who are there. Uh, but because it, it does like, it's very clear. It does, sh it shows you things really clearly. And certainly like, you know, it does, there There still is some, there's still some capacity, some ability there uh, in terms of your listening that, um, 
that has to be turned on in some way. But um, but the piece is very generous in that way. Yeah, let me, I was going to say exactly what Dylan said. I, I, I do think that it, 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 there's something unusual in the way that it teaches you how to hear it or guides you through it. It's something about the recursive structure, but there's, if, and, and it wants to be enjoyed. It's not, it's not a piece that wants to push you away. It really wants to bring you in. And also it was something I should have said before. One other thing that I noted in the 2018 performance, time behaves very strangely in this piece. There's, there was a, that, four hour performance and this other people have said this isn't just isn't just my experience that act one performance there were moments you were in it and it felt like you were in it all for all of your life or for years and then it was like no time had passed at all somehow it collapsed suddenly and it's really uncanny and but it wasn't just my experience there's something very unusual happens that both uh, uh makes possible and rewards that dedication of time. Your director, Liliana Blaine Cruz, was quoted in today's story in the, in the New York Times, the interview with Zachary Wolf as saying, I also think the dedication to joy is an interesting politics. I've long thought the creation of art is a political act, but have we gotten to the point where joy itself is a political act? I, I mean, I, I I agree with Liliana. I, I think the answer is yes, or maybe, I mean, yeah, I don't know about joy itself. Hopefully that's something that we just like still always have, but uh, but but certainly like something that is so committed to joy, uh, creating something that is so committed to joy, I, I do think it is. And I think it's, um, you know, the world is like, it's, well, life is very difficult <laughs> in a lot of ways. And I, uh, it is easy to be cynical and it's hard to quote Hannah Arendt uh, at times to love the world. And it does to me feel like a very important political uh, experience to find ways in spite of and in its totality and because of all the things within it to love the world. And I think this piece is really committed to that. Yeah, I'm, I haven't, <clears throat> I haven't read the article, but I'm really glad that uh, Liliana said that. She's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> I'm not surprised I agree with her. I would only add, I agree with also with what Dylan said. The piece really does reject cynicism completely, but it doesn't reject pain or suffering or difficulty. And as Dylan said, there's a despite. And for me, it's also related to the question of imagination. If there's nothing, if there's not a moment that you can affirm and say, yes, this is worth it. How can you imagine a world uh, different and better than the one you're in? Well, there's obviously going to be joy as part of getting this full production, you know, seen by the audience at Walt Disney Concert Hall on Saturday. But what was the role of joy in creating it? I mean... I've I've never I've never felt anything like the joy of feeling like something was so right and being able to to hold it. Um, that's unlike anything I've ever experienced in my life. Is to those moments of finding, uh, of like saying like this is this is how this piece ends, uh, and to know it is so so joyous. Um, and it I, as I kind of alluded to before, it's also wrapped up with like terrible, terrible anxiety, knowing that that something is so right and that it does not yet exist, which I still feel five days away. Um, and I have no idea what my life will feel like on May 21st, but um, but that that joy is so, so extreme and palpable. I just want so badly to share it with others. I'll give you an anecdote, Craig. Uh, so the way, one way we worked on this is that sometimes Dylan would send me um, these digital files of recordings of the music he'd written. And uh, I remember him sending me one and I would li was listening to it while I off on a run, which I often did. And um, this is uh, the scene called Jubilee. And I went for a run and as I got home, I, I stopped and it was like the sky had just opened and it turned out there was a whole nother sky up there. It was so glorious and I could feel the 
I, I could feel the the ultimate performance of it, and I could see it, and it just and this is a digital file of a computer generated. I mean, it's insane that you would have this feeling, but it was utterly transcendent. And uh, if that can happen, well, um, th there's some joy there. If you've reached this kind of joy with this work, which the world is going to see in its entirety, at least this iteration of it, you know, how do you chase the high? How do you move on to something else from this? It's a great question. I mean, we have we have the next project that we've been working on, um, which is which is helpful in so many ways, partially because it's really exciting, but also partially because it suggests that there's a world that exists after May 21st, uh, which is something that's hard for me to believe, but is really helpful to be reminded of uh, as much as we possibly can. And, uh, it, you know, I think about, um, yeah, I wondered at a certain point of like, well, if, you know, if I do this, create this crazy, huge thing that took every ounce of uh, my ability and energy for over 33% of my days on this planet, like maybe I'll just never do anything again. Like maybe I just go lie face down in the sand for the next however many years I have left on the planet and that'll be enough. And I think that's not what I want. <laughs> I think I think that, uh, I don't know, as long as I can, uh, I probably want to be chasing impossible things that I want for uh, other people to have access to on the world. I'm happy to report that uh, in my experience, Dylan's musical imagination is boundless. I'm, I'm not worried at all. And we can announce here first that this will be a series of miniatures that are all less than a minute in length and run no more than five minutes. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I am assuming you guys were heavily involved in the in the creation of the website for Stranger Love. Um, so I'm also assuming that it's no accident that there is a reference to John Coltrane um, because there is a reference to a love supreme, you know, in in on the first page, I believe. Yeah. And that makes complete sense to me because I think that what you're trying to do is a lot of what Coltrane was trying to do. Um, and this is how Coltrane described it for himself in the year 1957. I experienced by, by the grace of God, a spiritual awakening, which was to lead me to a richer, fuller, more productive life. At that time in gratitude, I humbly asked to be given the means and privilege to make others happy through music. Yeah. Are exactly. you guys on are you guys on that same same journey? And and is you know, you obviously have stated that you want people to be, you know, almost, you know, ecstatic at the end of this, but you know, is is this the journey? Are you on Coltrane's journey on a certain level? Yes, uh, absolutely. That's that's exactly the uh the space that that I want to be in. And and a love supreme is crucial to the piece in, in a lot of ways, like philosophically in that way. And in, in the way that, you know, he's in, he's invoking something, which, which you hear in that quote, that there's like, there's something more than this that he has access to and uh, something mysterious that, that he wants to share. And that's a big part of it as well. Um, and if you happen to be uh, wandering around the uh, inside parts of Disney Hall during the dinner break, you will hear at one point a piece of Love Supreme playing during the uh, that dinner intermission. Thomas? Uh, I can't say it better than Mr. Coltrane. <laughs> um, so having access to this, as Coltrane did, where does that, you know, I want to conclude by asking you both, where does this send you on your paths going forward? Is there, and is there responsibility with having access to that? I think responsibility is the exact right word. That That's, that's what it really feels like to me. I, I don't, um, I, I don't know exactly why it feels like I've had access to this thing. It doesn't it doesn't feel to me like it makes me any better, more worthwhile a person uh, or worse. Um, I, it's just like something that happened to align with the weird, um, like strange nature of who I am. Um, and because of that, it has set me on a on a path that gives me a really, really heavy feeling of responsibility because it does feel like if I'm the one 
you know, I don't know, I don't know if anybody else can create Stranger Love, but what I do know is that nobody else is going to. <laughs> and to know that it feels like to be able to see it and what it could be, uh, like it's it's worth my life to make sure that that happens. Um, and that's what I've done is spent my life to make sure that it happens. And uh, it's really it's really difficult, um, but it is it's a really important responsibility, I think, because I think it's worth it. And yeah, I want to, I mean, if anyone, anyone who's watching this, um, come hear the show, come listen to the music and don't take our word for it. Uh, I want to do everything I can to make it possible for people to hear it. And I want to make the next thing too. Um, and it feels, um, feels like a responsibility, but, um, a joyful one. Well, that's the point, isn't it joy? Yeah. Terrific. I thank you both for your time. Um, this is a really fascinating project and only it's only about two, what is, I don't remember the concert hall capacity, but it's about 2000, I guess. Something like that. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully there were, there will be other productions, you know, moving forward so that you don't have to just be in Los Angeles this weekend to see Stranger Love. <laughs> every Although, city, every city in the world is welcome to put on a production. That said, I hope you're here in Los Angeles uh, to see it on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you both very much and, and congratulations and, and have a wonderful opening and, and closing on Saturday night. Thank you so much. Really fun Thanks. to talk to you. Thanks Likewise. so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.